Our uh, text this morning is taken from St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote me to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except the widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. And when they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage, and they got up and drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might, might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Last week's scripture was the first half of this week's text. The first verse of our reading today was the last verse that we read last week. So Jesus made a claim last week. He said he was the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy written in Isaiah. God promises through his Messiah to comfort and redeem his people in the Isaiah passages. All spoke well of him and were amazed at his gracious words that came from his mouth. The word for amazed is actually a pretty mild translation. They were floored, their jaws dropped at the grace of what Jesus was saying. He had promised good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and the beginning of the messianic age. All those claims were made in his hometown, and they spoke highly of him, right up until someone cast doubt on the promise. Thirty years ago, we didn't know how his mother conceived. In that doubt casting, the honor of Jesus is questioned. Isn't this Joseph's son? How can the Son of Man come from Nazareth? Nazareth is barely even Jewish, let alone the birthplace of the Messiah. So Jesus has just preached God's word, which they received with joy, until someone questioned why God would choose Nazareth or Joseph's son. Jesus is looking for faith. He even tells us so later in this very gospel. He found that faith in the word of God that they had just so happily received. But in the accusation about being Joseph's son, they're now questioning the word of God based on the authenticity of the prophet, not on the word he has spoken. If Joseph's son is the Messiah, then as a member of our family, he must be planning to bring us even greater honors than he has elsewhere. As Jesus said, no doubt you will say, physician, heal yourself. We are your tribe and town. Surely, if he has done well in Capernaum, he will do even better among his own people. They're putting their hopes in the law rather than the good news that Jesus has just proclaimed. The rules of the family and the community state that blood is thicker than water. Here in Nazareth, won't he do even greater healing than he has done in Capernaum? But Jesus came to preach the gospel. He came to make faith in the word and promises of God. As they doubt that word, Jesus calls them out on their sin, their sin of refusing to hear that word. He reminds them that God has sent prophets before who were not heard or received in faith. And the prophets were often sent to outsiders, not to family. Elijah was sent to a starving widow at Sidon, just outside your own city. 
Elisha cleansed Naaman, even though he was a Syrian, also outside of your community. I was not sent just to you, but to all who are bound by sin. I was sent to outsiders with the word of release. In both of the cases Jesus cites, you have outsiders who frankly have nothing left. The widow literally tells Elijah that she, all she has is a little flour and oil, which she's going to take home to her child, where they will eat this last meal before death takes them. The prophet speaks instead a word of promise, a word of release from hunger. Her oil and flour will never run out if she feeds him first. Death already has her and her child. She is hopeless, but the prophet brings her a promise, which she believes, and then God fulfills his word. Naaman is commander of the Syrian army, but all of his social standing is lost to leprosy. He is a double outsider, a Syrian and a leper. But Elisha sends him word that he should wash seven times and be clean. He trusts that promise and God's word is fulfilled. The message is clear. Your sins are not a higher priority than the sins of the people around you. Tyre and Sidon. Your place under the word of God is the same as all sinners. You stand afflicted, dead, and in need of a savior. So Nazareth has a choice, except that they are sinners who cannot force God to save them or kill the messenger who has just called them all sinners. Confess their sin and hopelessness, along with the widow and Naaman, according to the promise God has given them, or continue to suffer. They must name themselves sinners or declare Jesus to be the sinner and seek his life which they could take for the blasphemy of claiming to be the fulfillment of God's word. Like all true sinners, they deny the promise of God and attempt to kill the very salvation from sin that they so desperately need. Jesus promised good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and the beginning of the messianic age. But this is only good news if you are poor, captive, or blind. Sinners who can't confess their poverty and captivity and blindness do not hear good news. They run. They hide. They turn away from God's word and do not trust his promise. And that's what's happened here. In the end, they tried to throw him off a cliff to silence the word of freedom he brought because the price that he brought, the freedom that he brought, because the price was too high. When a sinner meets Jesus, one of them is going to die. These hometown sinners thought to make it Jesus, who uh, dies and he will eventually die at the right place and, the, and at the right time for the very same gospel that he has just proclaimed at the beginning of his ministry. After he preaches the forgiveness of sins to all the poor, captive, and blind, his people will once again seek his life. At his cross, he finally plays out the promise that he has made in this synagogue. Jesus did not seek to honor his family, tribe, or town. He came to honor his father to bring glory to his name by forgiving sins and reconciling his Father to you who are captive to sin. Amen.